The health of the people is really the foundation upon which all their happiness and all their powers as a state depend. Benjamin Disraeli we've seen that physiology is the avenue to excellence. One way to affect physiology is to change the way you use your muscular system, you can change your posture, your facial expressions, and your breathing. Everything I talk about in this book also depends on a healthy level of biochemical functioning. It assumes that you're cleansing and nurturing your body, not clogging and poisoning it. In this chapter, we look at the underpinnings of physiology, what you eat and drink, and how you breathe. I call energy the fuel of excellence. You can change your internal representations all day long, if your biochemistry is messed up, it's going to make the brain create distorted representations. It's going to throw off the whole system. In fact, it's highly unlikely you'll even feel like using what you've learned. You could have the most beautiful race car in the world, but if you try to run it on beer, it's not going to work. You can have the right car and the right fuel, but if the spark plugs are not firing right, you won't get peak performance. In this chapter, I'm going to share some thoughts about energy and how to raise it to peak levels. The higher the energy level, the more efficient your body. The more efficient your body, the better you feel and the more you will use your talent to produce outstanding results. I know firsthand the importance of energy and the magic that an abundance of it can unleash. I used to weigh 268 pounds. I now weigh 238. Before, I was not exactly looking for all the ways I could make my life work. My physiology didn't help me produce outstanding results. What I could learn and do and create was secondary to what I could eat and watch on TV. But one day I decided I was tired of living that way, so I started studying about what produced outstanding health, and then I modeled people who had consistently produced it in themselves. The nutritional field was so contradictory and confusing, however, I didn't know what to do at first. I'd read one book, and it would say do this and this and this and you'll live forever. So I'd get all excited, until I got to the next book, which said if you did all those things, you'd die, so do this and that and this. Of course, as soon as I read the third book, it also contradicted the first two. All the authors were MDs, yet they couldn't even agree on the basics. I wasn't looking for credentials. What I wanted was results. So I found people who were producing results in their body, people who were vibrant and healthy. I found out what they were doing, and I did the same. I compiled everything I learned into a set of commitments or principles for myself, and I set up a 60-day program for healthy living. I applied these principles daily, and I lost 30 pounds in a little more than 30 days. More important, I finally found a way to live that was hassle-free and not diet-oriented. Notice what the first three letters in the word, diet, spell a way that respected how my body worked. I'll share with you here the principles I've lived by for the last five years. Before I do, though, let me give you an example of how they have transformed my physiology. I used to need 8 hours of sleep. I also needed three alarm clocks to wake me up in the morning, one that rang, one that turned on a radio, and one that switched on the lights. Now, I can lead a seminar all evening, go to sleep at 1 or 2 in the morning, and wake up after 5 or 6 hours of sleep, feeling absolutely vibrant, strong, and energized. If my bloodstream were polluted, if my energy level were tainted, I'd be trying to make the most of a very limited physiology. Instead, I start with a physiology that allows me to mobilize all my physical and mental abilities. In this chapter, I'm going to give you six keys to a powerful, undomitable physiology. Much of what I say will challenge things you've always believed. Some of it will go against the notions you now have of good health. But these six principles have worked spectacularly for me and the people I've worked with, as well as thousands of others who practice a science of health called natural hygiene. I want you to think carefully about whether they could work for you and whether your current health habits are the most effective way to take care of your body. Apply all six principles for 10 to 30 days and judge their validity be the results they produce in your body rather than by what you may have been educated to believe. Understand how your body works, respect it, and take care of it, and it will take care of you. You've been learning to run your own brain. Now you must learn how to run your body. Let's start with the first key to living health, the power of breath. The foundation of health is a healthy bloodstream, the system that transports oxygen and nutrients to all the cells of your body. If you have a healthy circulation system, you're going to live a long, healthy life. That environment is the bloodstream. What is the control button for that system? Breathing. It's the way you fully oxygenate the body and thus stimulate the electrical process of each and every cell. 
Let's take a closer look at how the body works. Breathing not only controls the oxygenation of the cells, it also controls the flow of lymph fluid, which contains white blood cells to protect the body. What is the lymph system? Some people think of it as the body's sewage system. Every cell in your body is surrounded by lymph. You have four times as much lymph fluid in your body as you do blood. Here's how the lymph system works. Blood is pumped from your heart through your arteries to the thin, porous capillaries. The blood carries oxygen and nutrients to the capillaries, where they are then diffused into this fluid around the cells called lymph. The cells, having an intelligence or affinity for what they need, take oxygen and nutrients necessary for their health and then excrete toxins, some of which go back into the capillaries. But dead cells, blood proteins, and other toxic material must be removed by the lymph system. And the lymph system is activated by deep breathing. The body cells depend on the lymph system as the only way to drain off the large toxic materials and excess fluid, which restrict the amount of oxygen. The fluid passes through the lymph nodes, where dead cells and all other poisons except blood proteins are neutralized and destroyed. How important is the lymph system? If it were totally shut down for 24 hours, you would be dead as the result of trapped blood proteins and excess fluid around the cells. The bloodstream has a pump, your heart. But the lymph system doesn't have one. The only way lymph moves is through deep breathing and muscular movement. So if you want to have a healthy bloodstream with effective lymph and immune systems, you need to breathe deeply and produce the movements that will stimulate them. Look carefully at any health program that doesn't first and foremost teach you how to fully cleanse your body through effective breathing. Dr. Jack Shields, a highly regarded lymphologist from Santa Barbara, California, recently conducted an interesting study of the immune system. He put cameras inside people's bodies to see what stimulated cleansing of the lymph system. He found that a deep diaphragmatic breath is the most effective way to accomplish this. It creates something like a vacuum that sucks lymph through the bloodstream and multiplies the pace at which the body eliminates toxins. In fact, deep breathing and exercise can accelerate this process by as much as 15 times. If you get nothing else from this chapter but an understanding of the importance of deep breathing, you could dramatically increase the level of your body's health. It's the reason that health systems like yoga focus so much attention on healthy breathing. There's nothing like it to cleanse your body. It doesn't take too much common sense to realize that of all the elements necessary for good health, oxygen is the most critical. Yet it's important to note just how important it is. Dr. Otto Warburg, Nobel Prize winner and director of the Max Planck Institute for Cell Physiology, studied the effect of oxygen on cells. He was able to turn normal, healthy cells into malignant cells simply by lowering the amount of oxygen available to them. His work was followed up here in the United States by Dr. Harry Goldblatt. In the Journal of Experimental Medicine, 1953, Goldblatt described the experiments he conducted with a species of rats that had never been known to have malignant growths. He took cells out of newborn rats and divided them into three groups. One of the three groups of cells was put in a bell jar and deprived of oxygen for up to 30 minutes at a time. Like Dr. Warburg, Goldblatt discovered that after a few weeks many of these cells died, the movement of others slowed, and still others began to change their structure taking on the appearance of malignant cells. The other two groups of cells were maintained in bell jars whose oxygen content was consistently maintained at atmospheric concentrations. After 30 days, Dr. Goldblatt injected all three groups of cells into three separate groups of rats. After two weeks, when the cells had been reabsorbed into the animals, nothing happened with the two normal groups. However, all the rats in the third group, those whose cells had been periodically deprived of oxygen, developed malignant growths. This work was followed up a year later. The malignant growths remained malignant, and the normal cells remained normal, what does this tell us? The researchers came to believe that lack of oxygen seems to play a major role in causing cells to become malignant or cancerous. It certainly affects the quality of life of the cells. Remember that the quality of your health is really the quality of the life of your cells. Thus, fully oxygenating your system would seem to be a number one priority, and breathing effectively is certainly the place to start. The problem is that most people don't know how to breathe. One of three Americans gets cancer. Yet athletes experience only one case of cancer to every seven in average Americans. Why? These studies begin to give us an explanation. Athletes are giving the bloodstream its most important and vital element, oxygen. 
Another explanation is that athletes are stimulating their body's immune system to work at maximum levels by stimulating the movement of lymph. Let me share with you the most effective way to breathe in order to cleanse your system. You should breathe in this ratio, inhale 1 count, hold 4 counts, exhale 2 counts. If you inhale for 4 seconds, you would hold for 16 and exhale for 8. Why exhale for twice as long as you inhale? That's when you eliminate toxins via your lymphatic system. Why hold 4 times as long? That's how you can fully oxygenate the blood and activate your lymphatic system. When you breathe, you should start from deep in your abdomen, like a vacuum cleaner that's getting rid of all toxins in the blood system. How hungry do you feel after you exercise? Do you want to sit down and eat a big steak after you've just run 4 miles? We know in fact that people don't. Why not? Because through healthy breathing your body is already getting what it needs most. So here's the first key to healthy living. Stop and take 10 deep breaths, in the above ratio, at least 3 times a day. What's the ratio? 1 count inhale, 4 counts hold, 2 counts exhale. For example, starting in the abdomen, take a deep breath through your nose while counting to 7 or pick a larger or smaller number based upon your ability. Hold your breath for a count 4 times that of your inhalation, or 28. Then exhale slowly through your mouth for a count 2 times the length of your inhalation, or 14. You should never strain yourself. See what numbers you can build up to by slowly developing greater lung capacity. Take 10 of these deep breaths 3 times a day, and you'll experience a dramatic improvement in the level of your health. There is no food or vitamin pill in the world that can do for you what excellent breathing patterns can do. The other essential component of healthy overall breathing is daily aerobic exercise, asterisk. Running is fine, though a little stressful. Swimming is excellent. But one of the best all-weather aerobic exercises is trampolining, which is easily accessible and puts minimal stress on your body. It is important that this concentrated exercise of trampolining be done without undue stress. You can slowly and carefully work your way up until you can go for 30 minutes with no pain, no stress, and no fatigue. Build a solid foundation before you begin to jog or jump up and down. If you exercise properly, you will be able to breathe deeply and continue until you have had a good workout. There are many books on trampolining and how it strengthens every organ in the body. Please take the time to pursue this life-enhancing form of exercise. You'll be glad you did. The second key is the principle of eating water-rich foods. 70% of the planet is covered with water. 80% of your body is made up of water. What do you think a large percentage of your diet should contain? You need to make certain that 70% of your diet is made up of foods that are rich in water. That means fresh fruits or vegetables, or their juices freshly squeezed. Some people recommend drinking from 8 to 12 glasses of water a day to flush out the system. Do you know how crazy that is? In the first place, most of our water isn't so great. Chances are it contains chlorine, fluoride, minerals, and other toxic substances. Drinking distilled water is usually the best idea. But no matter what kind of water you drink, you can't cleanse your system by drowning it. The amount of water you drink should be dictated by thirst. Instead of trying to flush your system by flooding it with water, all you have to do is eat foods that are naturally rich in water, water content foods. There are only three kinds on the planet, fruits, vegetables, and sprouts. These will provide you with an abundance of water, the life-giving, cleansing substance. When people live on a diet that is low in water content foods, an unhealthy functioning of the body is almost guaranteed. As Alexander Bryce, MD, states in The Laws of Life and Health, when too little fluid is supplied, the blood maintains a higher specific gravity and the poisonous waste products of tissue or cell change are only cast off very imperfectly. The body is, therefore, poisoned by its own excretions, and it is not too much to say that the chief reason of this is because a sufficient amount of fluid has not been supplied to carry off in solution the waste matter the cells manufacture. Your diet should be consistently assisting your body with the process of cleansing, rather than burdening it with indigestible food stuff. The buildup of waste products within the body promotes disease. One way to keep the bloodstream and body as free as possible from wastes and toxic poisons is to limit ingestion of those foods or non-foods that strain the eliminative organs of the body, the other is to provide enough water to the system to assist in the dilution and elimination of such wastes. Dr. Bryce continues, there is no fluid known to chemists which can dissolve as many solid substances as water, which is indeed the best solvent in existence. 
If, therefore, sufficient quantities of it are supplied, the whole process of nutrition is stimulated because the paralyzing effect of the toxic waste products is removed by their solution and subsequent excretion by the kidneys, skin, bowel, or lungs. If on the contrary these toxic materials are allowed to accumulate in the body, all sorts of diseases will arise. Why is heart disease our biggest killer? Why do we hear about people keeling over and dropping dead on the tennis court at the age of 40? One reason may be that they've spent a lifetime clogging their system. Remember, the quality of your life is dependent upon the quality of the life of your cells. If the bloodstream is filled with waste products, the resulting environment does not promote a strong, vibrant, healthy cell life, nor a biochemistry capable of creating a balanced emotional life for an individual. Dr. Alexis Carroll, a Nobel Prize winner in 1912 and then a member of the Rockefeller Institute, set out to prove this theory by taking the tissue from chickens, which normally live an average of 11 years, and keeping their cells alive indefinitely simply by keeping them free of their own wastes and by supplying them with the nutrients they needed. These cells were kept alive for 34 years, after which the Rockefeller Institute became convinced that they could keep them alive forever and thus decided to end the experiment. What percentage of your diet is made up of water-rich foods? If you were to make a list of all the things you've ingested in the past week, what percentage would be rich in water? Would it be 70%? I doubt it. How about 50, 25, 15? When I ask this in my seminars, I usually find that most people eat about 15 to 20% water content foods. And that's definitely higher than the population as a whole. Let me tell you something. 15% is suicidal. If you don't believe me, just check out the statistics for cancer and heart disease and review what kinds of foods the National Academy of Sciences recommends you avoid, and the amount of water content available in those foods. If you look to nature and you see the biggest and most powerful animals, you'll discover their herbivores. Gorillas, elephants, rhinoceroses, and so on all eat only water-rich foods. Herbivores live longer than carnivores. Think of a vulture. Why do you think it looks that way? It doesn't eat water-rich foods. If you eat something that's dried and dead, guess what you're going to look like? I'm only half kidding on this point. A building can only be as strong and as elegant as its parts. The same is true of your body. If you want to feel fully alive, then common sense dictates that you eat water-rich, live foods. It's that simple. How can you make sure that 70% of your diet consists of water-content foods? It's actually very simple. Just be certain from now on to have a salad with each meal. Make fruit the snack you reach for instead of a candy bar. You'll feel the difference when your body runs more efficiently and thus allows you to feel as great as you are. The third key to living health is the principle of effective food combining. Not long ago, a medical doctor named Stephen Smith celebrated his 100th birthday. When he was asked what allowed him to live so long, he replied, take care of your stomach for the first 50 years, and it will take care of you for the next 50. Truer words were never spoken. Many great scientists have studied food combining. Dr. Herbert Shelton is the best known. But do you know who was the first scientist to study it extensively? It was Dr. Ivan Pavlov, the man best known for his groundbreaking work with stimulus response. Some people turn food combining into something very complicated, but it's actually pretty simple, some foods should not be eaten with others. Different types of foods require different types of digestive juices, and not all digestive juices are compatible. For example, do you eat meat and potatoes together? How about cheese and bread, or milk and cereal, or fish and rice? What if I were to tell you that those combinations are totally destructive to your internal system and rob you of energy? You'd probably say that I'd made sense to this point, but now I'd lost my head. Let me explain why these combinations are destructive and how you can save yourself large amounts of nerve energy you may currently be wasting. Different foods are digested differently. Starchy foods, rice, bread, potatoes, and so on require an alkaline digestive medium, which is initially supplied in the mouth by the enzyme tialine. Protein foods, meat, dairy, nuts, seeds, and the like, require an acid medium for digestion, hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Now it is a law of chemistry that two contrary mediums, acid and alkali, cannot work at the same time. They neutralize each other. If you eat a protein with a starch, digestion is impaired or completely arrested. Undigested food becomes soil for bacteria, which ferment and decompose it, giving rise to digestive disorders and gas. 
incompatible food combinations rob you of energy, and anything that produces a loss of energy is potentially disease producing. It creates excess acid, which causes the blood to thicken and thus move more slowly through the system, robbing the body of oxygen. Remember how you felt after you dragged yourself from Thanksgiving dinner last year. How conducive is that to good health, to a healthy bloodstream, to an energetic physiology, to producing the results you desire for your life. What is the number one selling prescription drug in the United States? Do you know? It used to be the tranquilizer Valium. Now it's Tegamet, a drug for stomach disorders. Maybe there's a more sensible way to eat. That's what food combining is all about. Here's a very simple way to think about it. Eat only one condensed food at a meal. What's a condensed food? It's any food that's not rich in water. For example, beef jerky is condensed, whereas watermelon is water rich. Some people don't want to limit their intake of condensed foods, so let me tell you the least you can do. Make sure you don't eat starchy carbohydrates and protein at the same meal. Don't have those meat and potatoes together. If you feel you can't live without both, have one at lunch and the other at dinner. That's not so hard, is it? You can go to the finest restaurant in the world and say, I'll have the steak without the baked potato, and I'll have a big salad and some steamed vegetables. That's no problem, the protein will mix with the salad and vegetables because they're water content foods. You could also order the baked potato or two without the steak and have a huge salad and steamed vegetables. Will you leave a meal like this feeling hungry? Absolutely not. Do you wake up tired in the morning, even after 6 or 7 or 8 hours of sleep? No why. While you're sleeping, your body is working overtime to digest the incompatible combinations of food you put in your stomach. For many people, digestion takes more nerve energy than almost anything else. When foods are improperly combined in the digestive tract, the time it takes to digest them can be as much as 8, 10, 12, or 14 hours, even more. When foods are properly combined, the body is able to do its job effectively, and digestion lasts an average of 3 to 4 hours, so you don't have to waste your energy on digestion. Asterisk an excellent source for a thorough treatment of the subject of food combining is Dr. Herbert Shelton's food combining made easy. Also, my former partners, Harvey and Marilyn Diamond have written an excellent book called Fit for Life. It's filled with great properly combined recipes. For immediate information, see the food combining chart and simply follow these principles in your eating. Let's go on the fourth key, the law of controlled consumption. Do you love to eat? So do I want to learn how to eat a lot. Here it is, eat a little. That way, you'll be around long enough to eat a lot. Medical study after medical study has shown the same thing. The surest way to increase an animal's lifespan is to cut down on the amount of food it eats. Dr. Clive McKay conducted one famous study at Cornell University. In his experiment, he took laboratory rats and cut their food intake in half. It doubled their lifespan. One follow-up study done by Dr. Edward J. Masaro at the University of Texas was even more interesting. Masaro worked with three groups of rats, one group ate as much as it wanted, a second group had its food intake cut by 60%, and the third group was able to eat as much as it wanted, but its protein intake was cut in half. Want to know what happened? After 810 days, only 13% of the first group remained alive. Of the second group whose food consumption was cut by 60%, 97% were still alive. Of the third group where food intake remained high, but protein consumption was cut in half, 50% was still alive. Is there a message in this? Dr. Ray Walford, a famous UCLA researcher concluded, undernutrition is thus far the only method we know of that consistently retards the aging process and extends the maximum lifespan of warm-blooded animals. These studies are undoubtedly applicable to humans because it works in every species studied thus far, asterisk. The studies showed that physiological deterioration, including the normal deterioration of the immune system, was markedly delayed by food restriction. So the message is simple and clear, eat less, live more, asterisk. I'm like you. I love to eat. It can be a form of entertainment. But make sure your entertainment isn't killing you. If you want to eat large quantities of food, you can. Just make sure they're water-rich foods. You can eat a whole lot more salad than you can steak and remain vibrant and healthy. The fifth key to the living health program is the principle of effective fruit consumption. Fruit is the most perfect food. It takes the least amount of energy to digest and gives your body the most in return. 
The only food your brain can work on is glucose. Fruit is primarily fructose, which can be easily converted into glucose and it's most often 90-95% to water. That means it's cleansing and nurturing at the same time. The only problem with fruit is that most people don't know how to eat it in a way that allows the body effectively to use its nutrients. You must always eat fruit on an empty stomach. Why? The reason is that fruit is not primarily digested in the stomach. It digests in the small intestine. Fruit is designed to go right through the stomach in a few minutes and into the intestines, where it releases its sugars. But if there is meat or potatoes or starch in the stomach, the fruit gets trapped there and begins to ferment. Did you ever, eat some fruit for dessert after a big meal and find yourself burping the uncomfortable aftertaste for the rest of the evening? The reason is you didn't eat it properly. You must always eat fruit on an empty stomach. The best kind of fruit is fresh fruit or freshly squeezed fruit juice. You don't want to drink juice right out of a can or glass container. Why not? Much of the time the juice has been heated in the sealing process, and its structure has become acidic. Do you want to make the most valuable purchase you can? Buy a juicer. Do you own a car? Sell the car and buy a juicer. The juicer will take you much farther. Or just buy the juicer now. You can ingest juice as you would the fruit itself, on an empty stomach. And juice is digested so fast that you can eat a meal 15 or 20 minutes later, this isn't just me talking. Dr. William Castillo, head of the famed Framington, Massachusetts, Heart Study, has stated that fruit is the finest food you could possibly eat to protect yourself against heart disease. He said fruit contains bioflavonoids, which keep the blood from thickening and plugging up the arteries. It also strengthens the capillaries, and weak capillaries often lead to internal bleeding and heart attacks. Not long ago I talked with a marathon runner in one of the health seminars I promoted. He was pretty skeptical by nature, but he agreed to make the proper use of fruits in his diet. Know what happened? He took 9.5 minutes off his marathon time. He cut his recovery time in half, and he qualified for the Boston Marathon for the first time in his life. Here's one final thing I want you to keep in mind about fruits. What should you start a day with? What should you have for breakfast? Do you think it's a smart idea to jump out of bed and clog your system with some huge mound of food you take all day to digest? Of course not. What you want is something that is easy to digest, that provides fructose the body can use right away, and that helps cleanse the body. When you wake up, and for as long into the day as is comfortably possible, eat nothing but fresh fruit or freshly squeezed fruit juice. Keep this commitment until at least 12 noon each day. The longer you can go with just fruit in your body, the greater the opportunity for your body to cleanse itself. If you start to wean yourself from coffee and the other garbage you used to load your body down with at the start of the day, you'll feel a new rush of vitality and energy you won't believe. Try it for the next 10 days and see for yourself. The sixth key to living health is the protein myth. Have you ever heard it said that if you tell a big enough lie loud enough and long enough, sooner or later people will believe you? Welcome to the wonderful world of protein. No bigger lie has ever been told than the one that human beings require a high protein diet to maintain optimum health and well-being. Chances are you're pretty conscious of your protein intake. Why is that? Some people are looking for an increased level of energy. Some think they need protein to help with endurance. Some eat it for strong bones. Excess protein has the exact opposite effect in every one of those cases. Let's find a model of how much protein you might really need. When do you think people are most in need of protein? Probably when they're infants. Mother Nature has provided a food, mother's milk, that supplies the infant with everything it needs. Guess how much of mother's milk is protein? 50%, 25%, 10%. Too high in every case. Mother's milk is 2.38% protein at birth and reduces to 1.2-1.6% protein in 6 months. That's all. So where do we get the idea that humans need massive amounts of protein? No one really has any idea how much protein we need. After 10 years of studying human protein ingestion needs, Dr. Mark Hexted, past professor of nutrition at Harvard Medical School, confirmed the fact that most human beings seem to adapt to whatever protein intake is available to them. In addition, even people like Francis Lapp, who wrote Diet for a Small Planet, which for almost a decade promoted the concept of combining vegetables in order to get all the essential amino acids, now says that she was incorrect, that people do not have to combine their proteins, that if you eat a fairly balanced vegetarian diet, you will get all the protein you need. 
The National Academy of Sciences says that the adult American male needs 56 grams of protein a day. In a report by the International Union of Nutrition,